hurt and angered by the continuing viciousness of the Christiania critics, seeking to escape from the pain of his personal existence in Norway, Edward Munch leaves for France to study art. He meets with Emmanuel Goldstein, a 27-year-old Danish poet, whose own work bears a disillusioned view on love. Munch shares a room with Goldstein in saint Cloud, outside Paris, on the first floor above a cafe overlooking the River Seine. November 1889. It was a hard Dr. Munk död. Vi hade nettopp flyttet hit ut till Haukato och Dr. Munk trivdes svårt gott här ute. Och söndagen för han blev sjuk hade vi en tur igen från kyrkan var vi andra inte now that he and his father can never be reconciled, <coughs> Edward Munch begins to reassess the values and beliefs that Hans Jäger has taught him. Det bor stille folk, de døde. Det er en folkelig by. Benene smuldrer og gir plass for nye. Hva gjør de om en dør? Kun sov og kval, elendighet og kommer. Her har du nesten alt hva livet rommer. Du livets glæder og alt for dyrt betaler. Hver nyden købes kun med sovens kvaler. Har du i elskovs velløst hen dig givet, du avler alle kvaler spire livet. Eighteen eighty nine. The Eiffel Tower is built and the box camera comes into production. Vincent van Gogh paints landscape with olive trees and wheat field with cypresses and Adolf Hitler is born. In French literature, the symbolists hold full sway in Paris. Verlaine, Haussmann's, the poet Malame. A rebellion against naturalism is now taking place in the French capital. Amongst the painters, the older generation has already paved the way for the breakthrough. Puivis de Chevin, Gustave Moreau, and Odilin Redon, who emphasizes the role played by the subconscious in an artist's work. Når jeg har tent lys i lampen, ser jeg plutselig min enorme skygge over hele veggen, helt opp til taket. Og i det store speilet over kaminen, Ser jeg meg selv, mitt eget gjengangeransikt, og jeg lever med de døde. Der sto bare, kjære, kom i morgen klokken åtte. Jeg stirret på hver bokstav, så på hver flekk for å finne merker efter hennes fingre, Holdt hun av meg, eller spilte hun? Holdt hun av meg, eller den andre, eller begge to samtidig? Du er vampyren, der suger mit blod til rislende kvikke, af pulsenes årekanaler med de isnende, dragende blikke. Som ørkenens sandbund gløder mit lame, Brændt og forkullet, og vanvittigt tørre skirokko raser, og blodstrømmen rullede.
Munch now sees the work of Auguste Rodin in Paris. Vi kjente ikke hverandre en gang. Og likevel... Var det fordi hun tog mitt første kyss? At hun tog duften av livet fra meg? Var det at hun løy? Bedro? At hun en dag plutselig tog skjellene fra mine øyne? Munch now begins to formulate the artistic philosophy that he is to pursue all his life to understand and express the purpose of man's existence, of woman's existence, the purpose for their pain, their love, their despair, links in an endless chain tying together thousands of generations. <laughs> Det skulle ikke lenge males interiør, folk som leser og kvinner som strikker. Det skulle være levende mennesker som puster og føler, lider og elsker. Hun lukket øynene og lytter med åpen, levende munn til de ord han visker inn i hennes lange, utslåtte hår. Jeg skulle forme det slik jeg nå så det, men i den blå dis. Jeg husker noe Munch sa en gang. Det kan ikke ha vært mer enn et par år siden. Han snakket om døden. Han fortalte at han hadde oppdaget at grekerne betraktet døden som blå. I Iliaden så står det et sted blå død tildekker hans øyne. Her i det triste grå Norden, sa Munch, betrakter vi døden som sort. Men i det solfylte Hellas så betrakter vi den avgjort som blå. Hvorfor skulle den ikke like gjerne være det? De hjemme, min tante, min bror og mine søstre, tror at døden bare er søvn. At din far ser og hører. På mandag fikk han hjerneslag. Og i de dagene som fulgte, mistet han talens bruk og også bevisstheten. Innimellom tror vi nok han kjente oss, for han smilte og trykket hendene våre. Jeg kan ikke ante enn å la min sorg løpe ut i dagen som gryr, og dagen som skummerer. Munch's painting, Night in St. Clou, a study of despondency in swirling blue and black silhouette, is a major breakthrough in parallel to the similar breakthrough now occurring in Norwegian literature, a subjective and personal form of art. Jeg-formen i litteraturen er en introvert kunst som bryter med naturalismen på en psykologisk og en slags mystisk måte. Derfor kan det sies ting jeg-formen som før har vært usagt. Jeg-formen er født av trangen til å gå helt til bunns i det menneske eller den sinnstemning man da har foran seg. Og det blir da som et syn, som en hallucinasjon. Og da skulle det være veldig merkelig at nettopp denne formen for intensitet 
Vi kan da få medmenneskene til å bevre oss selve, lytte med, eller lytte etter akkurat det dikteren vil si. Ja, det er et brudd i tiden fra realismen ser et syn til den nye personlige formen. Kunst for kunstens egen skyld. Ja, også for kunstnerens egen tilfredshet. Endelig vil noen lytte til hva hjertets egen røst. September 1890. As proof of his work in Paris, Edward Munch submits ten paintings to the official state autumn exhibition in Christiania. The painting, which he calls Night in saint Clou, is heavily attacked. For the second time, Edward Munch returns to self-exile in Europe. Dette maleri, som kalles Natt, stiller slike krav til folks evne til å gjette at det bare er få som vil ta bryderiet ved å studere det nærmere. Atmosfæren omkring bildet er så svagt utformet at det liksom svinner hen før man kan fatte det. Hva selve kunstneren angår, så går han på sin egen stil i en formløs og tåket drømmeverden. And the critic of Aftenposten refers to Munch's sick mind and states that the borderline between madness and genius is unconscionably narrow. Munch er først og fremst lyrikeren i farver. Han føler farver. Han føler i farver. Men han ser dem bare ikke. Han ser sorg og skrik og grubbel og visnen. To the young poets and writers of Norway, now rejecting naturalism, the work of Edward Munch proves a revelation. Wilhelm Krag. Floden flyder så langsomt, rinner og rinner og rinner. Dagen svinner og svinner. Han kommer nok snart nu, natten. Lyset skinner seg ut av min stue, Venner seg, ser på meg, tyst og i rettsel. Det ved jo han kommer. Var det at hun var så meget vakkere enn de andre? Nei, jeg vet ikke engang om hun var vakker. Hennes munn var stor. Hun kunne være stygg. Dans en artikel que j'ai écrit dans le Mercure de France, Albert Aurier, spécialement critic, référé à ce travail de M. Gauguin, j'ai déclaré que le nouveau peintre avait le devoir de faire une sélection rationnelle des éléments multiples de l'objectivité. Il a aussi le droit de déformer, d'accentuer, d'exagérer ses caractères tels que la ligne, la forme, la couleur, en accord avec sa vision personnelle et sa subjectivité individuelle. Nice, 1891. Two lovers, their faces dissolved together, featureless, lurk in the corner of a room. Perspective has vanished, broken slashing strokes of thin paint. The breakthrough has begun. Hun var affektert, løy en hore. The affair between Uda Krog and Jappa Nielsen is now at crisis point. Jappa wants his relationship to be clearly defined. She, still married, feels differently. Jappa is now taking drugs and has threatened to kill himself. Det er liksom satt, satt opp regler for kvinner om at de skal offre seg. Det beste, det beste en, man kan si om en kvinne er at hun er selvoppoffrende. Du vet, jeg orker ikke mer. Jeg er så glad i henne, men hvorfor er hun så sint for meg? Jeg 
Jeg har det så vondt noen dager. Jeg vet ikke, jeg går ut helt ut av meg selv. Seeking a way of peeling down to the essence of the inner reality, of stripping away needless detail and perspective, Munch now combines all the forms of media at his disposal, using pencil, pastel, oil and charcoal, not separately, but together. He applies the oil thinly to permit the canvas texture to remain a visible component of the finished work to emphasize its flat surface. He allows the preliminary drawings in pencil and pastel, including the corrections made in them, to remain in the final work to show its spontaneity. On this canvas, to be known variously as melancholy, evening, or the yellow boat, Munch is attempting, for the first time in his work, to depict jealousy, and not merely the event of jealousy, but its psychology and innermost quiver. I don't know if there's anything between her and Jäger. What should I do? What should I do? I think that the meaning must be that we should live after the special möjligheter man har fått att man har en plikt till att utveckla dessa möjligheter man har en plikt till att ja till att visa ut till att få mer kunskaper större bredd jag tror att det också då för till större frihet på längre sikt se hur han hon flyter upp allt detta frisk og smilende, mens alle mennene ligger og forkommer. Alle er vel ikke slik at de har følelse for hverandre som varer livet ut? Men man eh, finner ut at forholdet ikke fungerer så burde man kunne bryte opp. Før, eh, før det går over i bitterhet og, og gnagende hat. This canvas marks a major development in the work of Edward Munch. It develops still further the flat application of color areas, the lack of perspective, the tension between space and surface. It is dismissed by the critics as a sketch. Edward Munch is now seeking to take the practical artistic consequences of what lies behind the theories of the symbolists. He wants to realize them in all powerful subjectivity, to pass on what he and he alone experiences from the motif at the very moment that he grips it, or that he is gripped by it. I went over the road with two friends. The sun went down. I felt like a pust of anger. The sky became suddenly blue and red. Jeg stanset, lente meg til gjæret, trett til døden. Så de flammende skyene som blod og sverd over den blåsvarte fjord og by. Mine venner gikk videre. Jeg stod der skjelvende av angst. Jeg følte som et stort, uendelig skrik gjennom naturen. The German Kaiser visits London hoping that Britain will agree to the Triple Alliance with Austria and Italy. There is civil war in Chile, widespread famine in Russia. Munch now paints and exhibits a portrait of his sister Inga, another breakthrough. Perspective has vanished. Space and surface are one. But this canvas, and his work known as Despair, with the artist's featureless and blank profile, its large disconnected strokes of heavy colour running over each other, are heavily attacked by the Norwegian press as an awe-inspiring gibberish of futuristic art.
For reasons which still remain unclear, Edward Munk is now formally invited by the Berlin Art Association, the Verein Berliner Künstler, to arrange a one-man exhibition of his work in their new exhibition hall, the Architektenhaus, a converted beer parlor on the Wilhelmstrasse. On the 5th of November, the exhibition opens, containing many of Munk's latest paintings, a total of 55 canvases. The Berlin press is here in force, including Adolf Rosenberg of Kunstchronik and a representative from the conservative National Zeitung. Here, in the Berlin of Kaiser Wilhelm II, Impressionism is still a term of abuse. The Kaiser himself, who once referred to Richard Wagner as a cheap little conductor, is dedicated to fighting what he calls the un-German type of art, or art of the gutter. <laughs> Within a matter of days, the exhibition of these paintings, the like of which has never before been seen in Germany, has broken into a notorious scandal. Hermann Eschke, sculptor, professor at the Berlin Academy of Art, seen here in the foreground, has raised a petition amongst the conservative members of the Verein to force through the immediate removal of monks anarchistic smears. The conservative majority is led by Anton von Werner, a painter of court and battle scenes for the Kaiser. Von Werner, strongly attacked by the liberals, who refer to him as a boots and uniform painter, urges the removal of Munch's Schmierei. <laughs> In opposition to these conservatives is the small caucus of liberal artists, amongst them Ludwig Knaus, who argue not so much for Munch's freedom of expression as against the social incorrectness of the Berlin Academy for throwing out an invited guest. Amid reports of anarchist activities in Paris and rising beer taxes in Bavaria, the German newspapers headline the struggle taking place within the Verein. On the 11th of November, the Conservative bloc carry the vote to close the exhibition, and Munk is ordered to remove his Schmierei. The Kunstchronik charges Edward Munk with brutality, crudity, and baseness of expression. The National Zeitung accuses this man, E. Blunch, of selling himself, body and soul, to the French Impressionists. Edward Munch has arrived in Imperial Germany. One critic even states that Munch knows next to nothing and should only exhibit if he is in dire peril of dying of starvation. Ich bin in die Rotunde gegangen, um zu lachen. Theodor Wolf, editor of the Berliner Tagblatt. Ich will es nicht leuchten. Aber mein Gott, ich habe nicht gelacht. Ich fand vieles Schrulliges 
ich möchte sagen, abscheuliches, aber ich fand auch feine, fast überzarte Stimmungen. Dunkle Zimmer, vom Mondlicht durchflutet, einsame Feldwege, die verschwiegene norwegische Sommernacht. Ich meinte, das Atmen von schwermütigen Menschen zu hören, die mit ihren Problemen rangen, aus ihrer Brust kam kein Laut. Sie saßen einsam am Strand. Mein Gott, ich habe nicht gelacht. Munch, choosing to be true to his vision, has painted the clouds over the Christiania Fjord as he saw and felt them. He argues that if he experienced clouds as blood during an agitated mood, then that is how he should paint them. Accompanied by his anarchistic Schmierei, Edward Munch moves into the room of a hotel in the Charlottenburg district of Berlin. Memories and images stored for over 20 years are about to break forth. All that is needed is one final catalyst. On the corner of Neuwilhelmstrasse and Unter den Linden is a tavern serving over 900 kinds of liquor and nicknamed the Black Pig, a meeting place for writers, amongst them, now living in Berlin, August Strindberg, who holds court in the Black Pig, where, in the words of a historian, he is virtually a tourist attraction for the intelligentsia. Laura Marholm, journalist, who with her husband has given financial aid to Strindberg, a source of growing resentment to the poverty-stricken Swedish celebrity. With Strindberg, in this room, are as many Scandinavians as there are Germans. Christian Krogh, who has accompanied his wife Uda to Berlin, where he watches her intense love affair with the Norwegian author Gunnar Heiberg. Sigborn Obstfelder, and next to him, Bengt Lidforsch, Swedish botanical student, recently engaged to a 12-year-old girl. Hermann Stettgen, <laughs> painter and engraver. In this room, a center of the literary storm that is to sweep over Europe, are those who have already rejected naturalism, who are now seeking an artistic or literary means of presenting the interior macrocosm of the soul, peering into the darkest abyss of man. Here, in the words of a historian, ideas change hands faster than mistresses. Here the writers feed upon the staccato genius in their midst. August Strindberg, in self-exile from Sweden, where he has been condemned as a blasphemer, where educationalists clamor for the suppression of his books, and where he is spat upon by parents in the streets. Within this room all is discussed. Art, black magic, spiritualism, the philosophy of Nietzsche, the erotic work of the Belgian etcher Felicien Rops, such as Thievery and Prostitution Rule the World. Richard Demmel, currently writing a cycle of poems about sex, their purpose to raise sexual love to the level of religious mysticism, shortly to be prosecuted because of his description of a nun masturbating. Stanislaw Przybyszewski, Polish-German author and medical student, involved with the occult, studies Satanism, who rewrote the opening of the Gospel of St. John to read, in the beginning, there was sex. And Edward Munch, famous overnight as the center of a storm that has rocked the German art world to its very foundations. Already, he has received invitations to exhibit in Dusseldorf and Cologne, and he has been prevailed upon by the Berlin intellectuals 
to make his home here in Germany. Of all the men in this room, two will have the most marked effect upon the work of Edward Munch. Stanislav Szybyszewski, who is to later believe that his passionate interpretation of Chopin will have more meaning for German literature than all his writing, and August Strindberg, divorced, separated from the children he adores, who presents the black pig with a triple credo. Woman the inferior, woman the whore, woman the man-weakening vampire. Gehen Sie in Munchs Hotelzimmer, werden Sie seine Bilder überall finden. Auf dem Sofa, auf dem Schrank und an allen Stühlen, ja sogar auf dem Ofen und auf dem Waschbecken. Amongst the group in The Black Pig is Laura Marholm's husband, the Swedish poet Ulla Hansson, who has had to leave his country following the reaction to his publication of a collection of short stories describing man's <coughs> split emotional sex life. Ulla Hansson tells Munch that he suffers from a fear of life, constantly seeing death, following him, like his own shadow. Jag tror jävligt lite på er emancipationsträvan. Jag tror den verkliga jämlikhet som ni eftersträvar, den innebär att jag skär av min penis och så stoppar ni i den er och sen så är vi alla lika. För närvarande så hatar alla kvinnor buddor. De misshandlar, oroar, förutmjukar dem med de underlägsna saker välvetande att de själva aldrig kan bli buddor. Vi vart! Skål! Skål! Dagny Juhl, age 26, daughter of a Norwegian country doctor who has come to Berlin to study the piano and who has been introduced to the black pig by her family friend, Edward Munch. sedan känner hon någon sorts instinktiv sympati för tiggare, skrävlare, lögnare, hundar, speciellt skabbiga. Under the eyes of Przybyszewski, who is in love with her, Dagny Yule now becomes the mistress of Edward Munch. Ja, men att vara gift är ju enda möjligheten att överleva för er kvinnor. Ni, ni, ni kan ju absolut inte existera utan en man. Om vi går i kronen så faller ni bara som kjeglor. Yay! Kvinnen vill du ha underkast i dag? Jag klarar mig lika bra utan kvinnor som med kvinnor. Är du säker på det? Absolut. Varför sidan den kvinnan vid sidan av dig då? At this time, Edward Munch is beginning to suffer from agoraphobia, a fear of open spaces. He walks close to walls and dreads to cross an open square. Hey, you should move it.
the year 1893. There is a general strike in Belgium, serious riots suppressed by the police. Hermann Goering is born, and Peter Ilyich Tchaikovsky dies. Von irgendwelcher künstlerischen Tradition, von irgendwelchen Anlehnen an althergebrachte künstlerische Ideale, kann bei Blunch, wie bei allen seinen übrigen Genossen, Here, in the Germany of Kaiser Wilhelm II, Edward Munch begins work on the subjective image of a naked woman, seen as from the viewpoint of her partner in sexual intercourse. Around her head, the halo of a Madonna. For his exterior model, Munch uses Dagny Yule. Dagny Yule, described by Strindberg as tall, thin, haggard from liquor and late hours, speaking with a drawling voice, broken as if by swallowed tears, with the figure of a Madonna and a laughter that drove men insane. <laughs> Strindberg has discussed with Munch his fear and distaste at the idea of his sperm coming in contact with the sperm of another man in the vagina of their common mistress. He believes that this meeting of similar poles, sensual contact with another male, is so unbearable and horrible that the normal man would often even prefer death. Jeg løper videre og videre. Jeg blir mer og mer angst. Ingen taler til hinanden. Ingen smiler til hinanden. De farer av sted som de var piskete. Så det er besværlig svært, en menneskelig figur daraus til å erkenne, eller overhovedet de natur av et gegenstand til å bestemme. Men han, han var så redd. Han kjente blodet rulle inn i brystet. 1893. An army bill increases the size of the German armed forces. An anarchist bomb explodes in the Paris Chamber of Deputies. Når han pustet, det kjente ut som brystet var løsnet. Og som alt Blod ville fosse ut av munnen på ham. Jesus Kristus! Strindberg has posed to Munch the question, what is jealousy? And has answered, jealousy is not the fear of losing, but the fear of dividing. Shubashevsky feels differently. He believes that no man should possess another human being and has even offered the key of his apartment to Strindberg so that he may avail himself of Shubashevsky's common-in-law wife. Strindberg has declined. Shubashevsky tells Munk that he believes sex to be life's basic substance and the inner essence of individuality the ever-creating, the transforming, and the destructive. Sex created the brain, says Przybyszewski, but between them there will always be a constant fight that will inevitably lead to death and destruction. Three years from now, in 1896, Dagny Yule, accompanied by Stanislaw Przybyszewski, will travel to the Russian city of Tiflis to meet with a lover who will shoot her through the head and then himself commit suicide. <coughs> Mm. 
working simultaneously on themes of love, pain, despair, and death, searching for the ever-elusive artistic solution to the expression of his feelings. Edward Munch turns now to tempera, the use of egg white to roughen the quality of the oil, to flatten and condense the image. He begins a new canvas depicting the death of his sister, one of a series to deal with the grief and isolation of his family, of himself. Munch depicts himself, his brothers and sisters, at the same age as if these events were happening in the present. Father, who do some marry him? Elliot Ward did it none. Come with it, drink it. She had him very yet from the inmate so hopefully. He was his heart, he would have a lot of work in it, so he of a lot of work in it. Only the security first, he said, and he was for the wound. He reeked at it, smacked no air in it, he had it. Amen. Wie gefallen Ihnen diese Mädchen hier? Ja, möchten Sie vielleicht ein blondes Mädchen? Diese Testamente, Bamuras, um dass wir mal werden snille. Og elske Jesus. Vi måtte alle sammen love henne at vi skulle fortsette å tro på Jesus. Jeg er så glad i mørket. Munch paints his Madonna with what he calls a corpse's smile. The moment of conception. Life shakes the hand of death. Bleiben Sie die ganze Nacht oder nur eine halbe Stunde? So von uns in der Garten. Die ganze Nacht. Ganze Nacht 30 Mark, bitte. At some time in this period, Strindberg, who is now courting an Austrian woman living in Berlin, takes Dagny Yule as his mistress. Referring to himself as Anderson, he writes in his notes, Anderson liberates her from the anxiety of a disorderly way of living. The hollow cheeks are filled out with fiery blood. The creator admires his creation. The painter is ignored and accepts it without protest. Das ist ja fein, dass Sie so lange Zeit haben. Das ist schon besser. Vielen Dank. Thank you. 
Munk begins work on a canvas, showing a woman bent over the neck of a weakened man. He says of this painting that, in reality, all it is, is a woman kissing a man on the nape of the neck. He calls the painting Love and Pain. But to Przybyszewski, the work depicts woman sucking the strength from a man. He retitles the painting, The Vampire. Munch lets the new title stay. <laughs> the woman known as Mrs. Hayberg divorces her husband on the 4th of April, 1891, and remarries a month later. Her ex-husband, the doctor, dies shortly afterwards. Savner du dine børn? Jo, nu så jeg er nok det. Er det kærligheden? Alle kvinder er egentlig noen helvete morer. February 1893. Edward Munch is in Copenhagen. The first exposure of his work in Denmark. It is his 15th exhibition. Munk uses the occasion to study the effect of his paintings placed next to one another in the order of their developing theme. For now he is planning and working on a whole cycle of paintings that will link together. A frieze of life, as Munk calls it, to unfold the very meaning of nature and existence. Munch returns to Berlin. The Danish critics echo the Norwegians and the Germans. Some of the pictures are shockingly bad. There is little hope that the artist's talent will develop. The disease is almost certainly incurable. Den sista söndagen pappa och jag gick upp Liabrubacken på väg till kyrkan. Kan jag huska att jag sa till honom I dag ligner du mye på Edvard. Gör jag svart han lycklig och rättet sig upp. Hur var det köpt det på Helglandsmannen eller? Det er vin. Det ser ja. dårlig ut. Det er en billig vin. Den er nachts heimkommt, begynt av zu malen. Und besuchen sie ihn morgens, stolpern sie vielleicht über eine Palette oder ein neues Bild, an irgendeiner total verrückten Stelle. 
By the early spring, Strindberg writes of Dagny Yule, when the spark has leaped and the currents are neutralized, he discovers that she is ugly. When he remembers how she has offered herself, he is overwhelmed by revulsion for her body. Visste du hvordan jeg led? Forstod du hvorfor jeg var hard? Jeg var ikke meg selv alene. Hun var i mig, i mitt blod. Inger lovte på vores alles vegne at vi skulle holde oss til Gud. Strindberg først offers Dagny Yule til the student Litforsch, who is known to be in love with her. But Litforsch tells Strindberg that he cannot accept. He is suffering from syphilis. Strindberg then turns to his next alternative, Dr. Ludwig Schleich, a habitué of the black pig. Schleich accepts. En man kan inte leva mer än ja, två, tre, fyra år med samma kvinna. Man, man måste växla er, erfarenheter, få nya erfarenheter. Kan vi inte, kan vi inte genom ett människa också älska och ha kärlighet till många människor på en gång? Vad ni vill är att bli män, inte att bli människor. Det är ju människor man ska sträva efter, ja, men inte att bli män. Både mannen och kvinnan blir stärka vid att vara eh, samman överför alla andra människor. Ja, jag tycker att kvinnan har blivit mer och mer manlig. Hon manlig. eftersträv hon eftersträvar ja, är mänsklighet, är men hon ser i mänskligheten bara manlighet. Någon som har upplevt hur det är att älska en kvinna som går som en man, som försöker att tala som en man, som försöker att röra sig som en man. Det, det är samma som att älska en man som upplevs som en kvinna. Äckligt. Trubyshevsky says of this painting, a man broken in spirit. On his neck, the face of a biting vampire. There is something terribly silent, passionless about this picture. <laughs> the man spins around and around, powerless. He cannot rid himself of that vampire, nor of the pain. And the woman will always sit there, will bite eternally. In his canvas, Death in the Sick Room, contrasted to the detailed, staring face of his younger sister, Inga, Munk depicts himself turned away, in profile, his face a blank mask. I was very glad that Edvard had got his stipend. I was very glad that he had forgotten to send me Edvard's testament. I wrote to Edvard that he had to buy it. At this period, as he paints Mrs. Hayberg standing outside her summer cottage, her shadow looming large, the psychic and sexual tension of Edward Munch is at an unbearable peak. Constantly, his nerves are at breaking point as he struggles to find the artistic solution to expressing his feelings. He is isolated from his family, separated forever from his father. His work is rejected in his own country. He watches his mistress, Dagny Yule, pass from one hand to another. His bronchial condition is worsening. He is drinking heavily. There are a lot of risks to share with a woman. The drug is a big amount of 
sperma i kvinnans vagina. Och ifall en man bestiger en kvinna som just har hållit en annan man så kommer den förra mannen sperma in i den för närvarande bestigande mannens organ. He believes that he is going insane, that he is about to die. The affair between Dagny Yule and Ludwig Schleich lasts, again, for only two weeks. Strindberg then agrees to help Schleich pass Dagny on to another man, and now offers her to Stanislav Shubashevsky. Strindberg himself is in good spirits at this time. He is about to leave Berlin for his marriage. He declares himself to be in love and glad to be rid of the wretched woman, DJ. Sier dig, du skal dø, stygg og stinkende. Og jeg, jeg drikker vin med jublende damer. Jeg skal le, enda mer. At this time in Berlin, a party is held in the Black Pig. Accompanied by the sound of the sea, Uda Krog, and an ex-lover of Strindberg, dance in the center of the room with crab tails placed in their hair. <laughs> With Sigrun Obstfelder, Ebert Munk briefly visits Christiania. At the same time, in Berlin, Dagny Yule is marrying Stanislav Shubashevsky. <laughs> Jeg ser, jeg ser på den hvite himmel, jeg ser på de grovblå skyer, jeg ser på den blodige sol. Dette er altså verden, dette er altså klodenes hjem. En regndråpe, jeg ser på de høye huset, jeg ser på de tusende vinduer, jeg ser på det fjerne kirketårn. Dette er altså jorden, dette er altså menneskenes hjem. De gråblå skyer samler seg, solen ble borte. Jeg ser på de velkledde herrer, jeg ser på de smilende damer, jeg ser på de lutende heste. Og de gråblå skyer blir tunge. Jeg ser, jeg ser. Jeg vil komme på en feil klode, her er så underlikt. I late 1893, using pastel on a base of cardboard, Edward Munk creates The Shriek. December 1893, a gallery on the Unter den Linden in Berlin. Edward Munk's 24th exhibition. Amongst the works exhibited are five of his life frees. 
listed in the catalogue under the title Studies for a Series on Love. Jeg flosserte bildene sammen, og det var akkurat som hvert enkelt av bildenes innhold hadde en sammenheng med hverandre. Det var akkurat som det gikk et en tone, en, en musikalsk enhetlig tone gjennom bildene. Så hvis et, hvis et forhold mellom to mennesker skal være bra, og det tror jeg det kan være, om ikke for evig, så må det bygges på gjensidighet, toleranse, In the words of Oskar Kokotschka, the Austrian expressionist painter, it was given to Edward Munch's deeply probing mind to diagnose panic dread in what was apparently social progress. One member of the public writes in his catalog that the exhibition is the world's greatest swindle. Junk. Take it all to the insane asylum. And Munch himself has written, in pencil, in the red sky of the Shriek, could only have been painted by a madman. Eighteen ninety four, a canvas entitled Anxiety. The faces of Edward Munch, Stanislav Shubashevsky, and Dagny Yor. Here, as in the shriek, the individual is in the grip of something far beyond his control. Jag har en vän, jag har en vän som gifte sig. Han var efter två månader så var han aldrig han var var som en suppe. Det var det var akkurat som hans kone hade dratt henne ut av munnen hans. Och kvinnan då? Kvinnan? Hon var ett fans kvinnfolk. Ja, det var hon. Hon hon tog tog allt ifrån den mannen. Hon brukte han som en hund. Hon sa kom och han kom. Skal vi gå? Og han ville gå. Han ville tenke deg noe sånt da. Vi måtte dra ham fra hennes omfannelse der han lå et sted mellom hennes bryst. Han var aldeles askegrå i øynene. Øynene var tomme. Det var et satans kvinnmenneske. Munch has now completed another three canvases. A woman pressed into the embrace of death. The gaunt face of Przybyszewski above his skeleton arm. And Dagny Yule, poised, inviting. Shubashevsky has himself published a short novel 
in which the hero gives his wife to an artist and luxuriates in the feelings of hate and jealousy that he has aroused in himself. <laughs> Engelska läkare har för närvarande direkt bevisat att ifall en familj, två barn, kommer samman i en säng så suger det svagare kraft från det starkare. Det står fullkomligt klart. Vem skulle då bli lidande hade du tänkt det? I sängen? Eller? Det starkare. Och det är mannen där det stärkare. Ja. August Strindberg describes Munch's canvas, The Kiss, as the fusion of two beings, the smaller of which, shaped like a carp, seems on the point of devouring the larger, as is the habit of vermin, microbes, vampires and women. för exempel älskar en kvinna och hon älskar dig tillbaka så är det en gensidighet där någonting som när vi snackar om, om, om en spänning och en kraft som går från ena till den andra så går den ju lika gärna den andra väg aldrig tänkt på det på den måten jag kan inte förstå Men det är det så komt Muss es denn unbedingt ein Kampf der Geschlechter sein? Unbedingt Muss es denn immer nur Mann gegen Frau, Frau gegen Mann sein? Für att vi för Jesus skull fick våra själar räddet allsamt. Gud vare med dig Sofie. Lille bleke Edvard, Andreas och Inger. Och du min söte kära förglömmelig uppoffrande man. Jag har också skrivit något till Edvard för det han är min äldste son. Trakte inte efter det som är på jorden, men efter det som är i himlen. Våk och be. Din mamma. Munk creates yet another version of melancholy. Black against the twisting, sinuous shore of Oskarstrand. Two rocks, like the black eyes of a snake, stare at him. A predominant characteristic of Munch's work in this period is the lack of contact between the human beings in his paintings. People remain isolated even though in direct physical contact. The sensory organs disappear, faces become blank, hands are clubs or curved hooks as the features of human contact are eliminated. For Edward Munk himself, human contact is becoming a matter of fear. Fear of his own ego dissolving into the psyche and into the body of another. Yeah, 
Die Bilder beeindrucken mich sehr. Die Farben und die Strichführung mit einfachen Linien drückt da so viel aus. Ich finde sie fantastisch. Ich glaube, es hat bisher keinen Künstler gegeben, der sich messen kann. Also wenn ich ehrlich sein soll, so gefallen mir diese Bilder überhaupt nicht. Ich bin ja kein Kunstkenner, aber mir sagen sie nicht zu. Diese Art, wie er malt, gefällt mir überhaupt nicht. Es ist alles so unnatürlich. Die Farben sind nicht naturgetreu. Blaue Bäume, das gefällt mir nicht. Und auch die Figuren sind nur angedeutet. Es sind keine klaren Formen. Auf mich macht Munk einen gewaltigen Eindruck. Ich finde, er spiegelt sehr viel Menschliches in seinen Arbeiten wieder. Und er schildert die brutale Wirklichkeit, so wie sie ist. Also ich bin ein Landsmann in von Edward Munk und ich habe viel von ihm gehört, dass er furchtbar ist und schrecklich, aber mir gefällt es und ich fühle, dass er sagt was über die Menschen und zu mir spricht er. Ich kenne eigentlich etwas von den Situationen und fühle, dass er spricht wahr. Ich glaube, das ist für mich so. Working in hotel bedrooms, on park and railway station benches, in bars and restaurants, using the small piece of copper which he carries in his pocket, Edward Munk begins his first engraving, the theme which he captured at the prior year on his canvas, Death and the Maiden. A naked woman, stretched on tiptoe, presses her full body into the embrace of death. Towards the end of the 19th century, a new interest has developed in the medium of the graphic. In Germany, Munch, here in the company of a professor of graphic art at Berlin University, studies the latest trends in copper engraving, in particular the widely published etchings of the German Max Klinger. Here his cycle of eight developing studies entitled Ein Lieben, A Love. The technical brilliance of Klinger's work, its painstakingly studied detail, its use of black and white masses, its fashionable though superficially treated themes of eroticism and despair, intrigue Munch, and reinforces his desire to treat a similar cycle on a far deeper and more expressive level. Yeah. Jeg traff en aften en ung kvinne på gaten. Hennes øyne tiltrakk meg. Det var store barneøyne. Jeg så på henne, hun snudde seg, og, og vi slo følge. Vil de bli med meg opp? Sier jeg. På mitt værelse ser hun litt slusket i kledd ut, og det var tegn på fordervelse i hennes ansikt. Men øynene var skjønne og barnslige. Hvorfor ble det med meg, sa jeg? Ja, det er jo derfor jeg går på gaten, sier hun. Munch writes in his diary, Ill, ill, and lonely. He wanted to put his tired head on a soft lady's breast, smell her perfume, hear her heartbeat, feel her soft curved breasts to his cheek, and when he looked up, meet her look above him, 
and then he would close his eyes and feel her warm, deep look and her soft, lustful smile. And then she would stroke his hair softly, downwards, downwards. In Munch's diaries appear these words. I greeted, the girlfriend laughed a little, the pale one smiled a bit too. And may I introduce myself, painter? I take the liberty, I want to paint you. I bought half a bottle of port and went to the studio with them. Han skjulte blomstene. Hverken søsteren eller faren hadde oppdaget det. De ville ledd hvis de hadde sett det. Hele dagen senere tenkte han på henne. Det var sant at hun så livstrett ut. Men svært snill var hun. Var det virkelig sant at... They stopped. Brandt looked at the large house, somber looking between the trees. The maids had gone to bed. Then it was as if he was supposed to say something, but was unable to find the words. I have to go, she said slowly. He put out his hand and took hers without shaking it. Goodbye then, he said, and left. She was a swan. I lived down in the water among slime and horrible animals. Remembered a time when I lived up there. I forced myself up, reached for the swan, couldn't reach it. I saw my face, terribly pale. I heard a shriek, and I knew it was I who had cried. The swan was far away. During the two years of 1893 and 1894, sometimes alone, sometimes with the help of Adolf Paul, biographer of Strindberg, Edward Munch lists, labels, checks, crates and dispatches upwards of 50 or 60 canvases to each of nearly a dozen major exhibitions. Dresden, Breslau, Hamburg, Berlin, Frankfurt. He travels hundreds of miles by train De sorge, sonnenuntergang, countless hotel bedrooms, often working on three or four canvases simultaneously and always under attack. I 
In July 1894, at the age of 31, having painted for 14 years, created some 80 canvases, organized 30 exhibitions, Edward Munch receives his first serious recognition as an artist, 500 miles from his own homeland. The publication in Berlin of four essays by the influential art critic Julius Meyer Greffer, Stanislaw Przybyszewski, and two other German critics. The first evaluation of Edward Munch's art and its importance for the contemporary age. Constantly seeking other forms of graphic art, Munch moves to etching and aquatint, the use of acid to bite the image, and a base of cooked resin powder to give added texture. His theme, a man comforting a crying woman. Why would I not be able to do it again? I could put my arms around his head and say where I was held by him. It was always that chance. At this time, Strindberg is in Paris, already separated from his wife, living in the utmost poverty, engaged in chemical experiments, trying to make gold from copper, about to begin the writing of his short story, Inferno, an autobiographical study of psychological collapse. Monday kveld fick han slag, og han døde tre dager senere. Das Buch von Maya Greffe und Przybyszewski und zwei weiteren Mitarbeitern stellt einen Meilenstein für das Verständnis des Werkes von Edward Munch dar. Soll man den Eindruck, den es ausstrahlt, auf eine Formel bringen, kann ich mir keine bessere denken, als ein geflügeltes Wort von Goethe zu paraphrasieren. Von hier und heute an fängt eine neue Phase in der Weltgeschichte der Kunst an. Und ihr könnt sagen, ihr seid dabei gewesen. President Carnot of France assassinated, Alfred Dreyfus arrested, in Sicily, food riots, martial law, suppression of the Italian socialist parties, Japan declares war on China. Hvor himlen blev veldig og trøne sort, endeløs, uten dødsens stillhet. Nær, nær ved, og langt, langt bort. Hvor mørkt jeg blev, blev hos meg i natt, min sjel er så angst og så bange. Mørket har de selsomst dyrker, og stillheden særeste klang. Vennerne går, og enige jeg sitter dypt ut i natten. Hva er det som lysner over fjellet? Hva er det som gløder over havet? Hva er det som glinter gjennom mørket? Hva er det som brenner hen ad himmelen? Det er ikke skyer mot aftenrød, 
Det er ikke gjenskinn fra en dag som er død. Det er slikkende ild og rinnende blod. Det er lune sverd og en brannrød flod. Det er dommedagsangst og dødens kval. En skrift som flammer i nattens sal. Av livets gådefulle rettsel. Dypt ut i natten, alene jeg sad. Jeg følte der drog et vondefullt skrik over den gudsforlatte verden. Oktober 1894. The first exposure of Munch's work in Sweden, the land of Strindberg. With one exception, the critics are merciless, even discovering points of similarity in the erotomaniac drawings of the mentally deranged. Edward Munch returns to Berlin. The Swedish Academy officially repudiates Munch's work, stating that the Academy allies itself with the verdict of rejection of which Edward Munch has become the object on the continent. Alle de andre. Noen røde i ansiktet av gråt, andre hvite, utenfor kimte klokkene. De ringte julen inn. Inne i det andre værelset stod det pyntede juletre, så morsomt og trist. Jesus, hjelp meg! Tror du jeg kommer til himmelen hvis jeg dør? Det tror jeg, gutten min. Hvis du tror. Much of the tension in Edward Munch during these years is his search for a knot to tie together the disparate themes of his life frees, to explain and clarify and unite them. Now a theme emerges. The triple aspect of Munch's feelings for woman, the temptress, the devourer, for whom he has both a revulsion and a deep longing, the virgin, the innocent, for whom he has respect, the giver of life, the mother, the sacrificer, for whom he has compassion. The complexity of Munch's suffering, of his art, is that each of these three images, for him, are one and the same woman. April 19th, 1895. Munch's younger brother, Peter Andreas, marries Johanna Kink, age 22, daughter of a headmaster, with, it is said, the mental age of a girl of 12. Munch writes, he should not have gone through with it. From father's side of the family, we inherited poor nerves. Then there was mother's lung weakness. The year 1895, H.G. Wells writes The Time Machine. Sigmund Freud founds psychoanalysis Italian troops advance into Ethiopia, <coughs> and Edward Munch creates a new lithograph, self-portrait with skeleton arm. Then I thanked her shortly and accompanied her to the gate. Wouldn't I come inside? Uh, no thanks, it's, it's getting late. She looked a little bit disappointed, I thought. I went home quickly, rather satisfied with myself. I felt I had got a small revenge. A lady dressed in black. He quickly walked up the street after her. He started to run, ran like mad, pushing people away. He stopped, short of breath. He was ashamed, running like that. Fool, it wasn't her after all. 
At times the blood ran down the sheets. His father was on his knees in front of the bed, praying, his hands stretched upwards, his voice husky from crying. Lord, I beg you, I demand from you, don't let him die today. He is not prepared. I beg you, have mercy on us. Let him live. He will always serve you. He has promised me that. Can you be there so vacant? No, I can't. Have you ever lost? Så rar du er. Ikke som de andre. Han sov lite om natten. Hans lepper brant. Han trykket sin hånd inn til dem. Han var igjen der ute mellom trærne. Han opplevde igjen hvordan hun ga efter. Hvordan alt forsvant omkring ham. Og han følte igjen den kildrende bløtet om munnen. Hvor mange ganger har du sittet alene hjemme om aftenen og ventet på din kone? Lyttet efter hvert trinn. Hun sa hun skulle til en veninde. Den veninden som hun som regel aldri besøkte. Oktober 1895. The Blomqvist Gallery i Christiania. Munch exhibits 40 works. Amongst them, the life freeze. The exhibition is heavily attacked. The newspaper Morgenbladet states, so much nonsense and ugliness, dreadful, low and repulsive, grimacing and confused, crude and shrieking hideousness. The newspaper Aftenposten attacks the life freeze as being a number of sensual fantasies, the hallucinations of a sick mind. A boycott of the building is called for, and the police are summoned. Det er noe av det verste jeg har sett. Jeg forstår ingenting av det. Jeg blir helt, jeg blir helt forvirret. Og så, og så er det så stygge farger. Dessuten er det umoralsk i høyeste grad. Skal man gå hit, så må man nesten lure seg inn bak dørene for å gå inn og se på det. Men det er jo en ganske pen ung mann, så jeg kan ikke forstå at han, at han vil finne på sånne ting. Jeg kan jo ikke ta med seg familien og gå og nyde kunsten som man kunne før. Det er ikke det at jeg er tilhenger av sensur, men når man ser sånn, så, så kan jeg ikke forstå hvorfor det skal henges på veggene. Barn kan jo se det alt mulig. Edward Munch returns to Berlin. Når vi kommer ut, så vil jo folk lure på hvilket, hvilke moralske begreper man har når man skal se på det. Det er ikke bare det at han maler stygge farger, men han maler sånne ekle ting som vi ikke snakker om en gang. Det gjør vi ikke min mann og jeg i hvert fall. Jeg ser på dette som noe det må ta slutt på. In late November, Peter Andreas Munch, now married for six months, writes to his family, I can't stand life anymore. And three weeks later, is dead. Many of Munch's contemporaries now rally to his support, realizing that his art is probing into a new and revolutionary understanding of the human psyche. Munch søker eiendommeligheter, mystikk i alt det som kommer an fra øyet. Han ser verden i bølgelinjer, trær, strandlinjer, kvinnehår, skjelvende legemyr. Og som ingen annen norsk maler har Munch tatt sikte på å få det dypeste til å skjelve.
working on the theme of the staring, isolated faces in his oil-on-canvas anxiety, Munch now turns to the final of the graphic arts that he is to conquer, woodcut. Already he has seen the use made by Paul Gauguin of the grain and texture in wood, the stark and simple outlines of the blocks cut in Tahiti. The Japanese use of differently colored contours of wood, the instant impact in the use of primary white and black by the Frenchman Paul Valadon. In this field, Munch perhaps surpasses all his other work. He invents a method of cutting out individual pieces of wood shaped to various <coughs> contours in the picture, inking the pieces in their different colors and then fitting them back together again like a jigsaw, ready for printing. He uses the grain in the wood and takes again the familiar themes of the frieze of life, reducing them to an essential force and simplicity for which he has been searching for 10 years. Seeking for more effective ways of spreading his philosophy of life and death, constantly fighting against what he sees as the suppression of his own personality, Edward Munch turns more and more to graphic art with its multiple prints. Within one year, his graphic output has tripled as he turns from dry point to etching to woodcut to lithography in black and white and color.
In a letter written by the nurse of Peter Andreas Munk were these words. He asked me to read a little to him on the Friday afternoon. He wanted Christ's speech from the summit. With each attack of suffocation, I had to give him a shot of naphtha. In the last attack, three shots. On the Saturday night, we put him in his bridegroom clothes. Deres avis har referert til Munchs malerier som, jeg siterer, mer eller mindre forvirrede og uartikulerte, uhyggelige eller vemlige vrengebilder. Ja. Er ikke dette ganske sterk språkbruk? Jo, det er det. Våre følelser for Munchs malerier kommer best til uttrykk i en fotnote som jeg selv personlig har lagt til vår anmeldelse. Forfatteren har visselig rett i at publikum er forarget over all den utstillede ekkelhet. Dess mer beklagligt er det at man allikevel gir fullt hus til sådanne utstillinger. En tom salong ville være den beste regulator på utskjeilsene. Jeg må si meg enig med Aftenposten i at dette ikke er kunst, men smuss. For the next 14 years, Edward Munch is to lead a life of increasing pain and isolation. His illness, aggravated by smoking and alcohol, is to grow worse. He is torn by the themes of jealousy and suffering, by the thought of his own death and his descent into a literal hell. The conservative press is to continue its attacks on his work and, other than for periods spent at Osgerstrand, where he once met with Mrs. Hayberg, he is to spend most of 14 years travelling endlessly from one country to another. He is to paint a major theme, the dance of life, in which the couples do not see each other. Se disse gatene. Kryp av mennesker de flyr på hverandre. Omnibussen er kjørende med masser av menneskesjeler. De ser likegyldige på den glade, ute alene. Though most of his work is to deal with the problems of human communication, Munk is to try again with two more relationships, one of which will result in physical and psychic injury. And following a nervous breakdown, he will finally place himself into a psychiatric clinic in Copenhagen in 1908. At the same time, Munch is to be notified that he has been made a knight of the Royal Norwegian Order of St. Olaf.
Lad då ofta märka mig för. Hör jag så ofta på det? Jag ser inte att du ligger på Kristus. Edward Munch's aunt, Karen Bjorster, will never marry. His sister Inga will never marry. Laura Munch will withdraw deeper into her isolation and will spend a brief period in a clinic. Uda Lasson is to break with Gunnar Heberg and to become the lover of a Norwegian doctor while remaining married to Christian Krog. Orsa Carlson will remain married until her death at the age of 40. Dagny Yule, accompanied by Stanislav Shubashevsky, will go to Tiflis to meet with a Russian lover who will shoot her through the head. The woman known as Mrs. Hayberg will divorce for the second time in 1911. She and Edward Munk will never meet again. I felt as if there were invisible threads between us. I felt as if invisible threads from her hair still twisted themselves around me. And when she completely disappeared there over the ocean, then I felt still how it hurt where my heart bled, because the threads could not be broken. <laughs> 